Mesoanalysis can be absolutely confusing for just about anybody, beginners or advanced people who are interested in weather and storm photography. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you some of the things I look at on this page to kind of hopefully simplify it a little bit so you can use this with a little bit more confidence. Are you ready? Let's get going. So the first thing we have to do is we have to, well, we have to go on to the Storm Prediction Center website and go to the Mesoanalysis page. It's going to look a lot like this. When you're on the Mesoanalysis page, there, there's a bunch of options, right? Let's, uh, let's adjust this window just ever so slightly so you can see just a little bit more uh, away from the watermark. And you can see all of these options running across the top and there are literally dozens of possibilities to choose from. Uh, this can be overwhelming, I won't lie, uh, but that's why we're here today. We're going to teach you a little bit about how, what, what to look for. Let's just go tab by tab. We're gonna go across these tabs uh, like this. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of things in each tab that you should uh, pay attention to. First one, of course, is surface. And let's just go to the temperature, wind, and dew point. Uh, we're looking at the Southwest US today during monsoon season. I hope this is helpful. Not a plains day, but we're gonna do the best we can. There is a severe weather risk today in this region. Uh, you can see, there's, this is a pretty good example though of what uh, of the temperatures and the dew point differences and how they're shaded differently and such because temperatures these pink areas right here those are all really hot temperatures talking 100 degrees or more here in death valley you can see it's already up to 108 got that right there uh, back here in arizona it's a little bit more rain cold with 80 degrees but there's lines everywhere the dashed lines are the dew points you see these greens and blues filled in those are different dew point temperatures. Uh, once you get down here into the greens, you're more into the 60s. Uh, the blues are kind of in the mid 50s. Whites are below that. And everything that's kind of dashed in white is going to be lower tier moisture. When you want to start seeing the blues, you want to start seeing the greens, and then you can eventually, like right down here, get into a more of a orangey, green, yellowy, green type of look, and that's even higher dew points. So when you're looking at this chart, you want to make sure that you're looking for uh, areas where the heating is maximized with the dew points, etc. We'll have other charts to look at, but this is a good way to see a couple of things uh, when it comes to the surface conditions. A little bit finer than like the surface obs, which you can see here. A lot of uh, areas here that are not really covered by surface charts, that's where the temperature wind dew point map can come in. It can help you really fill in the gaps there. Now, something that I also use in this area, three hour dew point change. It's, it's exactly what it sounds like. Where have the dew points gone in the last three hours? Are they falling like here in Southern Arizona where they've fallen by four degrees or are they rising like here uh, north and west of Los Angeles where they're up by four degrees? Uh, you can kind of see that. Uh, and this is really helpful. The Oklahoma Mesoanalysis site has this for like the state of Oklahoma and their Mesoanalysis sites or Mesonet sites, but there's nothing like this for uh, the entire country except on this page. It's a great resource. Let you see if dew points are mixing out, if they're rising. You can, of course, track this yourself, but this is a nice shorthand way to do that. Now, we're going to move on now to the upper air charts. Uh, let's go over here to the 300 millibars. I think this is a great uh, starting point. We, I'll do a whole course, a whole lesson on all these eventually, because I do think upper air is something we haven't talked about enough on the channel, right? So, but here on the 300 millibars, this is way up there in the atmosphere. These areas of pink are areas of divergence. These are the areas you're looking for, for a little bit of added upper air lift. Oftentimes you're going to see when the heating, when the, at that heating of the evening or uh, an afternoon are happening, you'll see uh, storms form along and ahead of these areas of divergence, especially when they coincide with surface boundaries. Uh, and so that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the flow. You're looking for areas of divergence, all those things. Uh, if you change the sector, let's just go out here to the middle of the country. And you can see also some areas of divergence kind of swinging around uh, across the southern plains there. So 
you, you, you'll be able to tell a lot of different things by that, right? So that's a good way to look at the upper air. Another thing I look at is the vorticity advection from 700 to 400 millibars. Uh, this is showing the shaded areas are areas of vorticity. The blues and the reds are that change. And basically you're looking for area, these kind of vorticity lobes along and ahead of them in the flow for the maximum lift. Uh, this is, again, something that's a little bit more complex. But say right here, you have a little bit of a disturbance working through. These X's tend to indicate that, little waves of some sort. And you'll see rain and storms form ahead of these oftentimes. Like we're going to have a lot of rain and storms here in uh, New Mexico later today. You're going to, there's rain shower storms ahead of this stuff right here in uh, southern New Mexico. So you're going to see this. And also right back here, though, you can see these are, this is the center of the high pressure area where the flow is going up and around. You could see that in the 300 millibar analysis too. You can see that's the area of the upper high. So just so you know, along and ahead of these in the flow. I see these, the flow here is north and west. These are moving south. And this is where the lift's going to be along and ahead of those. Okay. So next up, let's move on to the next possibility. And that one, we're going to move over here to thermodynamics. And we talk about this in several videos. Okay. I, I don't need to go over why MLK is the best. Again, just look at our instability videos for why I like this index the most when it comes to capes. Now, here on this chart, you can see uh, you can see the red is where the cape is. That that's the measures the cape. Here's a thousand cape bullseye here. It's right there, uh, just east of uh, Las Vegas, northwest, north and west of Kingman. You have 500 uh, joules per kilogram cape, and then the area is shaded in blue. This is the inhibition. If you see blues, that means you have a strong amount of inhibition, strong cap, something like that. When you get into these uh, light blues, that's when storms become a little bit more possible and whites mean pretty much completely uncapped. So on storm days, you're going to often, this is being filmed right about noon, and you're going to see this a lot of times on storm days where it starts off really capped and then it kind of progressively heats up. It's kind of like you can see it happening with the heating of the day. It's been going on longer over here than over here, right? So that's one way to look at that. Now, another thing I like to look at in this area is this chart right here. This is the LCL to LFC mean relative helicity. When you are looking at this, you want to look for values 60 to 80 and coinciding with areas you're expecting severe weather. If it's dry, like out here, that means you have very dry air between where your cloud bases are and where those air parcels in the cloud are free to rise. LCL and LFC are explained elsewhere on the channel. Again, this is not that video. This would be a two hour video if I had to explain all this. This is to set you up on this page. So you're looking for areas where there is cape and there is also moist air in that area. That is an indication that your capping is less. And also it, when there is a little bit of capping but storms, you're not going to be dealing with as much drier entrainment, which can really affect updraft intensity, even prevent storms from really taking off. Okay. So with that said, we're going to move on to the next area here, and that is the shear. Okay. We're going to look at the bulk shear from surface to six kilometers. This is an important uh, measurement for sure, because this is how you tell if supercells are possible. Anything 30 or above, you start thinking supercells possible. Uh, 40, if there's a reason why it's bolder here, that's where you really get into supercells likely. Uh, it does denote all the way down to 25 knots of bulk shear, which depending on the day, it's sometimes you can get a supercell with that. But 25 uh, or above is when storms can organize a little bit more and be a little bit more uh, long lasting is the best way to put it, right? So uh, you're looking for anything 30 or above for sure, uh, for supercells possible, 40 or above, 40 or higher is where you really get into the good stuff. Also, as a bonus here, you can see the shear vector direction. This is also going to be where your updraft is located. Uh, just think about the center point and think that the rain is being blown 
down and away from that updraft in that direction because that is where your updraft is going to be tilted over towards. That's where your preset is going to be falling. So that's just one little thing in terms of positioning. Always position to the right of that. So in this case, if you're wanting to look at a storm out here in the Four Corners region, be to the west and south of it. Now, the next thing we're going to take a look at, though, we we haven't talked about this enough on this channel. Storm relative helicity effective. There are several different options. You you see surface to three kilometers, surface to one kilometer, surface to 500 meters. All those are interesting and useful in their own way. I have become a big believer in effective SRH when it comes to tornado possibilities. Anything over 100 is absolutely could see tornadoes today given the right storm mode, etc. 50 is where you start thinking tornado would be possible if everything else was cooperative. LCL heights were the right uh, amount, etc. But you, this also can help be helpful in terms of tornado or supercells and in terms of how likely they are as well. Again, anything 50 or above, your ears perk up, but 100 or above, you're really starting to think about that. So storm relative helicity, the effective one I like the most. It, we do t I talk about storm relative helicity in other videos. Um, those are on the channel. You can check those out as well. But that, that's just a very quick explainer of how I go about using that. Again, it's pretty self-explanatory in terms of how to read this chart. But a thing that I do want to point out on this one of, as a bonus is that this is your uh, storm motion, expected right mover storm motion. You can see which way storms are going to move and the speed on this, these charts. In this case, here in uh, Arizona, they're going to be moving uh, west 20 knots, 20, 15, 20 knots. So that's, that's a good way to see it. And you can also, you know, it kind of follows the upper air flow in a, in a similar sense of where it's rounding around this upper air high. But it's a great way. It's a great way to see uh, storm motion as well. Now, another thing I look at on this are storm relative winds. Uh, I, I, again, this is another thing. I need to make just videos about all these tabs because this is something to really explain. Surface to two kilometer, I look at anything 20 or above means bigger updraft sizes usually. Not, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one match, but you're looking for that 20 knots or above for your storm relative flow in the low levels for really good uh, updraft size. The more, the better. If you get these little values like 10, 15 knots, that's when you get into those small updrafts that need a lot of mergers through the day. Uh, 20 knots is still kind of in that range, but you can make it work. Uh, anything above 20 though, the further up you get from 20, the better you're gonna be here. Four to six kilometers is sometimes seen as a tornado marker as well. Anything 20 or above, given all other favorable parameters, of course, uh, is more favorable for supercells and tornadoes. Anything below that, like out here, 15, 10 knots, etc. More multi-cell, single-cell type of stuff. So that's another one. And uh, storm relative winds here at the anvil level are 9 to 11. Uh, basically, anything below 40, you're looking at more high precipitation type of storm modes. And above that, you're looking at more and more progressively LP storm modes. So 40 is kind of that cutoff there. I like this for determining storm mode over time. So with that said, I think it's time to move on to the next tab. So when we're looking at the next tab, we're looking at the composite print indices here, violent tornado parameter. Of course, there's nothing here, right? I don't know if I'm going to be able to find an area in the country that has a possible, has this outline. So this might be a waste of our time. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, anything one or above uh, that you see here in uh, the Carolinas uh, indicates uh, the possibility given the right storm mode, etc., of tornadoes. Violent tornadoes, you, you want to really go up in the scale on this for stronger tornadoes. Uh, but in terms of getting uh, tornado uh, potential, I look for anything one or above on this scale. Uh, there's also, you know, the SIGTOR parameter, which is a little different, but also shows a similar bullseye. But I like the violent tornado parameter because it does, it's a little bit more sensitive, I think, to uh, possible tornadic environments. But if I am looking at SIGTOR, I do like the 0 to 500 kilometer SRH because that's becoming a little bit more of a favored area for, uh, I guess the better way to put it, for tornado potential. So 
I love that. I love that as far as composite. Uh, also, super silk composite, obviously. We, again, this is like all feels like a video I need to like really do like an hour long lecture on this. Maybe that's coming for Titan Supporter Club members at some point in the future. Now, multi parameters. Again, I'm going to go down here surface vorticity, surface three kilometer cape. This is uh, known as the cheat code for some folks uh, in storm chasing because anywhere you see really strong three kilometer cape overlaid with vorticity, which are these blue lines, uh, that is an indication of uh, unstable low levels and spin in the low levels. Does not mean tornadoes when they cross over all the time because here it's happening here in like southwest Kansas. There's not a tornado risk there today. Probably won't be tornadoes there. This is, uh, I think, very useful, again, when all the other indices are there for tornadoes. Your three-kilometer cape, or three-kilometer uh, shear is there, your six-kilometer shear, LTL heights, all those things. When they're all combining, and this is all to favor bright-moving supercells, and then you have this overlaying, this is when this becomes useful. Not useful if storm mode is not cooperative, but this is very useful if you're going to have like right-moving supercells. So I'm a huge fan of that. Now, moving on over here, I love also on this beta section, and we're going to move back over here to the Carolinas, I think, because you might be able to see this. The Tornadic 0 to 1 kilometer EHI, it is basically the helicity and the instability in the lowest one kilometer. I love this uh, for looking for tornado potential. I'm, I kind of mix and match these, like the SIG tour with the violent tour with this uh, EHI with the tornadic tilting and stretching is the other one I want to talk about, which shows the potential for the atmosphere to tilt and stretch, uh, vorticity and to the vertical. When all these are kind of lining up in the same area, and I also know that storm mode is going to be cooperative. Uh, here you can see bulk share not quite cooperative for supercells uh, right now. Uh, this is a, a, a place I would be looking for, for uh, things. And you have a bunch of other uh, probabilities here. Like, th this is all very interesting. Again, I think uh, I want to go into all this more into a, a deeper video with all this. But these are the things I look for. Uh, for uh, looking for the possibility of severe weather. Uh, you can see uh, it's just basically one of those things where you have to take all these into context. Another thing that is so very important to know is mesoanalysis is a model, so it's not perfect. It's working on the best data it's been given, so it can be wrong. The other thing is real time. It is not a forecast for four hours from now. Environments change. This mesoanalysis is really useful for pinning down a target at the last moment. When you are trying to figure out, uh, go north 70 miles or south 70 miles, you have an hour to make that move, and you're trying to figure it out, mesoanalysis is where you want to be, what you want to be using to decide those two things when it comes to getting the best photographs on any given day. If you do not do that, if, you, if you're if you just kind of relying on uh, like the HRRR for this, that's, that's fine, but I feel like that is missing a few details that you can get here. You can get way more data here on mesoanalysis that you, than you can. You can even get like satellite data if you wanted just a static satellite image. Uh, you can do all these different uh, overlays and such with it. So, for instance, if you're wanting to kind of be able to see different things, uh, watches and warnings, even the uh, day one outlook, you can see all that on here. You can overlay a bunch of data. Huge fan of mesoanalysis. I hope uh, this video was a little bit helpful in figuring out a few of the things I'm using for weather photography. going to go into all these in more detail in a future video. This is a rapid fire look. So, hey, if you like this, you want to know more, well, be sure to like and subscribe. We'd love to have you along for this ride. And also, well, remember this too. Weather's for everybody. And if this confuses you, it's, it's for you too. Photography is for everybody too. And I am so excited that you are here and I am ready to, well, let's keep teaching. It's going to be a great time. We're going to talk more about mesoanalysis in the future. So we'll see you next time.